Hello, 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 everybody. Uh, this is the great Johannes speaking, Johannes Mathis Conrad. I'm a Dutch guy. I sometimes do uh, live streams uh, on this uh, TikTok app. I will repost this video to my YouTube channel at the great Johannes. Uh, I used to do streams almost every day and I decided to do them just once a week. Because if I do them once a week, I'll have more to say, more to talk about, and it's less stressful for me. If I have to do them every day, it becomes a bit too much of a chore and uh, I won't always have too much to say. So I see some people coming into the live stream. Feel free to ask questions if you want to discuss anything with me at all. I suppose I'll just go over anything that comes up with me. This is live, unprepared, um, no script, unscripted. Uh, but I usually find something to talk about, right? So a few days ago, a Dutch uh, a media TV show host, Tim Hoffman, felt the need to smear me on his Twitter channel. He has about 300,000 followers, but after one day after he posted the expose or whatever it was, uh, only about 700 people had liked it. So it's almost as if... Twitter just doesn't have the same reach as TikTok does. Usually my videos get, you know, can get, can sometimes easily get, you know, 1,000 likes, 5,000 likes or more, right? It happens, but mm, basically this guy, Tim Hoffman, is a TV host presenter for the state media. And he found one of my videos in Dutch. Uh, I, ha I have a Dutch TikTok account where I sometimes post, not as frequent as on my English account. And I was speaking about the potential for a popular uprising and what we would want to do with it. Well, you would want to have primarily housing. I thought my main plan was to give housing to young women, to give young women, Dutch women, priority housing, meaning before we allow foreigners from abroad to come into the Netherlands, uh, we should give, we should uh, arrange housing for our own women makes so much sense to me that this is a, a political policy we should be pursuing. In fact, I think every nation around the world should be pursuing that kind of policy, especially in our time. And this guy, Hoffman, twisted my words. He lied about it. He lied and said that I was a woman hater who wanted to strip women of their rights, when in fact I wanted to do the exact opposite. I wanted to give women... Uh, housing. So it's interesting that when the mainstream media go after you, they lie. They flat out lie, hoping that because they have a lot of followers, people will believe the lie. Luckily, even though he has a lot of followers, no one really seems to engage with that post at all. So what I did was I just blocked him and ignored it, and that was it. I did make some videos about this topic to see, uh, you know, to give them to give people my point of view that I actually argued for something totally different but that's interesting right so they they go after you they call you crazy they call you a woman hater and they call you a mustache man he kept calling me uh, uh referring to Anton Mussert uh, Anton Mussert was like the Dutch Mussolini uh and uh he had a party called the NSB the National Socialist Movement and there was only one city in all of the Netherlands where he managed to get into the uh, uh, municipal, uh, what do you call it, where he managed to get a seat in the, uh, in the municipal uh, uh, college or whatever. Uh, this was Amsterdam. So that's interesting. The only, the only city in the Netherlands where the fascists actually voted themselves into power was Amsterdam in those days. Nowadays, Amsterdam, of course, is a far left um, yeah, what do you call it? I think Amsterdam is a really bad place nowadays. It, you know what's strange about Amsterdam? Uh, at some point, they had a shortage of people willing to work as a cook or a cleaner and so on, right? Especially in restaurants to be uh, a server or a waiter. And instead of just hiring the one of the countless people in the Netherlands who are actually unemployed, they decided to hire... Americans, yeah, believe it or not, they began recruiting U.S. American citizens to come to the Netherlands, to come to Amsterdam, to work as worker, uh, waiters and servers. But they refused to hire a ton of migrants who are living in the Netherlands who have no job. And I think the reason is that 
uh, for two reasons. The, the people, the leftist people who live in Amsterdam, they actually don't like to deal with brown and black people at all. And secondly, of course, a lot of immigrants coming to the Netherlands, uh, they neither speak English nor Dutch, so they then preferred uh, Americans, for example. Amsterdam, is, it's just not a real city anymore. It's a, a real strange hotspot of tourists with immigrants and some locals who are still stuck there. I heard, I read somewhere that local Amsterdam people, the ones who were actually born there, whose families had been from there for several generations, they are actually constantly moving out. So their numbers are dwindling relatively as well as absolutely. And uh, everybody else moving into Amsterdam are, is a foreigner, immigrant, you know, because after all, few Dutch people can actually afford to live in Amsterdam. It's just too expensive. It's not worth it. It's overpriced. I suppose it's like that in many places like London and Paris. These, these places have started to become overpriced. It's not worth working for what you can get from these cities. If you want to have some, you know, nice housing, for example, you're probably not going to get that. Uh, you know, in a place like uh, Amsterdam or London on the salaries that they will pay, pay you, you know. Amsterdam hates the English, yeah, I suppose so. <laughs> the stag parties, yeah, or whatever. Uh, someone writes, uh, yeah, they're scrambling and panicking, using their power to do anything to stop us, yeah. Uh, and Amsterdam is full of self-proclaimed free thinker journalists who all grew up with daddy's money. Yeah, that's that's my impression as well, that they are uh, a lot of these rich leftist socialist type people in, the, in Amsterdam, they don't earn an income, they earn dividends. So they have a daddy who owns stock or something, or they or they get some stock yourself. Yeah. Hello, long time, yeah. Uh, where have you been? Well, it's been the holiday seasons, you know, uh, Christmas and New Year's Eve, and so on. I didn't feel like uh, producing too much live stream content, but I'm getting started again. I'm gonna start doing this once a week now, not every day, but you can always follow me on my TikTok channel. Uh, at the Great Johannes, where I will be posting more regularly now. Uh, there are so many things on my mind. I discovered a channel called The Daniel Natal Show on YouTube, and it is an absolute gem for anybody who wants to upgrade their right-wing logic. Uh, I spent the past few days absorbing almost all of the videos that guy made. over the He made those videos over the past two years. And he doesn't have a lot of followers. He has not, not even 2,000 subscribers. I suppose he used to work for uh, the New American magazine from the, of the John Birch Society. But this guy in particular, Daniel Natal, I would say he's like a wunderkind, you know, or, or a boy wonder. <laughs> he looks like Danny DeVito, but he's like, he's so smart and so knowledgeable. I've learned more in three days watching his videos than I've had in my whole life before that, you know. Um, and, and it really helped me figure out my own politics. Like, what do I really believe in? So, you know, when, when I talk about the elites and I talk about the billionaire class and I talk about them, you know, what is it really about this parasitical class that upsets me so much? What is it about them that makes me uh, want to overthrow them? The answer is, very simply put in one word, utilitarianism. The people I oppose are utilitarians who see the end as the goal and therefore they justify all the means. So they want money, which in itself is not an interesting goal. You can think of better goals like, like uh, rebooting European culture, for example, and, and reinvigorating our architecture, our art and music and so on. That would be a goal that I would believe in. But these people, the billionaire class, the uh, banker elites, right, the Zionists and so on, they are at heart materialistic and utilitarian. They only care about money. They only care about the numbers of the money. They don't even care about culture or art or anything. They use all these things, fake wars, fake media stories, fake engagement, fake pandemics, fake, fake you name it, fake conflicts, as long as they can keep selling uh, 
you know, arms to wars. Most of the weapon, most of the money spent on the war in Ukraine was actually spent on American weapons manufacturers, for example, on the American security system. So that's what it's all about. It's all about coming up with reasons, excuses to spend money, basically to spend the people's, the taxpayers' money on anything that f makes the money flow to the billionaire class. Basically, you're living in an oligarchy and in an oligarchy, the, the goal of an oligarchy is to strip the people of their money and transfer the wealth from the people to the few, to the elite, the bankers, the billionaires and so on. And that's exactly what's happening. right? But they do it under the guise of democracy as though they still want to make you all equal. But of course, by equality, what they really mean is they want to make the middle class equal to the lower class so that no one will have money. Right. Uh, you'll have nothing and you'll be happy. You'll own nothing and you will be happy. That's a threat, right? Oh, what was his name again? Yeah, the guy I was watching, I'll type it in, the Daniel Natal Show. Absolute genius, especially his shorter videos that are anywhere from like four to 10 minutes. He has so many of them. It will, it will take you, if you want to watch all of them, it will take you like two days. Uh, but each and, one, each, each and every one of them is so good. It explains uh, some aspect of our reality. Uh, it really benefits you to know if you are into the right wing movement and you want to upgrade your logic and your arguments, definitely check this guy out. He's like, yeah, he's so advanced in his thinking, uh, way beyond anything I could have possibly come up with on my own. So I, I actually learn a lot from him now and incorporate that into my own thinking, right? So I'm going to start <laughs> echoing a little bit of the things that he talks about. You know, for example, that, you know, w what should drive our movement? Uh, he talks about this, this difference between being moralizing or, be between, or being an ethical people. He says that in a, in, in a republic, what the United States used to be, the United States used to be a republic, not, not, not what they want to make it into a democracy as it is today, right? But a, the, the original American republic was founded on the principles of promoting virtue, meaning of making people the best versions of themselves in terms of their skills and competencies, but also in terms of their personal ethics, their personal morality. How do you live? How do you treat people? How do you want to be treated? You know, you have these Christian principles like treat people the way you want to be treated, like the golden mean or the golden rule, things like that. That was what was being promoted in the Republic. That, that was the culture of the American Republic. But look at it today. It's the exact opposite. They're not promoting, your, promoting people's virtue or virtuous life anymore. They are promoting you to do whatever it takes to get the outcomes you want, money. And in terms of the middle class and the lower class, they'll tell you that you just have to be equal to everybody else. And if someone is not equal to you, it's because you're a racist, right? And then they want to degrade you and humiliate you into submission to, so that you will give up your money so that the other will have the equal outcome. And that's what it's all about now. It's about, you know, what they call equity. Equity is that uh, it's beyond equality because in, an, in a system where two people are treated equally, people may still have different outcomes. In a competition, you may still have different outcomes. Someone may actually be better at something because they spent their whole lives training and working to be better in a certain field or in sports or in business, right? And so someone may excel even though you were treated equally. But equity says, no, 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 no. You may be better at something, but you can't have more than what someone else can have who is n totally... Uh, incompetent in this certain field. So wh what do you think about national conservatism? Uh, I don't know. I like, well, nationalism is something I definitely support because nationalism forces the state, as I was talking about, to invest in their own people. If you rely on your own people, you can't really import people from abroad. You're stuck with your own people. Then you better invest in them to make them productive, creative. And this means you have to support them, give them the sense that they are important. Your own people are important, right? <clears throat> You're not going to be replaced. If, if, I am a, if I'm a, a king of a nation and I know I cannot replace my people, I will want my people to be the best version of themselves. I will want to promote virtuous life. I was just talking about this. And in terms of conservatism, well, you know, what does it even mean nowadays, conservatism? Uh, 
at this point, we should be talking about the restoration. How are we going to restore or rebuild all that was lost, all that conservatism couldn't conserve? You know, cons modern conservatism today, like Douglas Murray conservatism, or the new French prime minister who is openly gay conservatism? No. Oh, I, I seem to have connection issues. Hold on. Let's see if... Uh, am I reconnecting now? All right. Okay, maybe the screen froze for a bit, uh, but I guess I guess I'm back now. Okay, right. So I was talking about conservatism, and uh, uh, I think modern conservatism is a total joke. Like turning point conservatism, where they say that you know you can get gay married, and this is a conservative value. Knock. What is going on in the world is exactly what I was mentioning. Um, they're they're pushing the opposite of virtues onto you. They're pushing degeneracy onto you. But why? Why is that? Well, this is something that Daniel Natal, that I mentioned, the Daniel Natal show, he can explain this even better. Um, I'm going to try to phrase it in, in my own words. Why are our elites pushing the degeneracy onto their own people? The answer is they truly fear a revolt. They, refer, they fear an uprising of the people, the middle classes especially, against the ruling business, uh, billionaire classes, their elites, the banker elites. And in order to prevent that, you need to sabotage your people. Tyrants throughout history have also done this. True tyrants who fear their people, who fear that the people may oust them, for example, they begin sabotaging their people to weaken the people, divide them, break them apart, so they cannot unite against the monarch or against the dictator or the tyrant. And so that's exactly what's going on in the West, Western world today, in Western Europe, North America. The middle class still hold considerable competencies. They are strong. They know what they do. They have skills, right? They might actually unite against the billionaire class. This is what I think the J6 is all, all about. The January 6th story that allegedly Trump was trying to uh, start an insurgence or something, that didn't happen. Trump did not do that. The whole J6 story is a lie. But then why do the media focus so much on it? And why do they want to, you know, go after people who were there? Why do they want to jail so many people who were there? It's preemptive. See? See what they're doing? It's preemptive. The, the ruling classes that are in the shadows behind Biden and behind Obama and so on, right? The ruling billionaire class, they really do expect the people to, to, to rebel. And they're trying to preempt that. See, they're smarter than the people. The people think that life is somewhat random. They see uh, events, political events and historical events as though these, these were random episodes in a soap opera, right? Like as though no one is behind the scenes pulling the strings, yet that's exactly what is happening. The billionaires are pulling the strings and they're trying to set you up so that you cannot revolt against them. With the 15-minute cities, for example, they will lock you up. With the lockdowns during the pandemic era, they lock you up. They're going to tell you that you can't travel no more. Imagine that within the USA, you were, you're not allowed to travel by air anymore, or you're not allowed to travel more than a thousand miles per month or so outside of your home circle. Well, how, how are you going to march on to Washington then? How are you going to drive out the billionaires from their gated communities on, right? So they're really setting you up in order to try to prevent you, to sabotage you from being strong. So this is also why they push the LGB rainbow cult. The LGB rainbow flag cult is designed to weaken men specifically, right? Uh, the majority of men who think they are transitioning, uh, I mean, the majority of people who think they are transitioning are actually men. Why is that? Why do they want men to think they can be women? Why do they want men to be women? So they won't revolt, to weaken their resolve, to make them unmanly, to make them, uh, you know, feeble-minded, especially feeble-minded. So this is why they're promoting stupid people into positions of power and authority like Claudine Gay of Harvard. She was incompetent, but they made her president anyway. Why? They don't want you to think that you can be competent and strong and healthy and vigorous. They want they, they give you these, these weak, feeble leaders to signal the message to other weak, feeble people that they are now in charge. But of course, they're not feeble people are not in charge they are the slaves of the billionaire so they're trying to turn anybody who might have the capacity for living freely into basically a slave 
who doesn't know that he is a slave. The perfect slave does not know he is a slave. Some people are sending me gifts on this thing. Thank you very much. Anything helps so I can buy a cup of coffee tomorrow, right? I don't drink coffee. I drink, <laughs> I drink something else. Yeah, are they attacking my stream? And maybe I have a poor internet connection. I've been suffering it the whole time. I'm going to try to do something about it. But so far, uh, it's still live and going, right? So, yeah. Can't really change that right now. Uh, let me see over here. Android, yeah. So what do you think about the Jews? Well, I kind of mentioned it in a cryptic form is that they are actually utilitarians. And that's my whole issue with them. It's, it's the same issue I would have with white people who are like that. You know, lots of white people are also utilitarians. But that's the main issue. They are a closely knit ethnic group of people, you know, working together for their own interest at the expense of everyone else. And the real difference is, is that they are a group of utilitarians, whereas everybody else still maintains some sort of a morality it is morality and ethics that hold others back from being so unscrupulous but the situation is not uh eternal you can only exploit the world for so long until you run out of people to exploit or until you run out of uh, resources to exploit and so on and so forth so it's not it's an it's not a never-ending game this is a game that will have an end it will come to an end you know it's not going to last forever. Spain has a parliament member with Down syndrome. Yeah, that's to be expected. France now has a gay PM, openly gay PM. You know, they do it to demoralize you, to prevent you from feeling like, look, if you're working at a company like Boeing, you know, in order to make a plane, the engineers, the designers, the architects, everybody involved in that process has to have a culture or of excellence. They need to know that excellence is not only required, but that it is rewarded. They need to know that the most excellent engineers can become managers or can get promotions. But as soon as you promote a very dumb person into the position of leadership at Boeing, what are you signaling? You are signaling to the whole organization that all of a sudden excellence no longer matters. What matters is that you are a dumbass with a certain skin tone. It doesn't no longer matters that you are actually good at what you do. What happens is the people who used to be excellent, realizing that they are never going to get a promotion anymore at this kind of company at Boeing. Why would they try harder? Then first, the first that's the first thing they do. They quit trying harder. They quit trying to get better. They will go with the flow for some time until eventually they maybe move out. If they have, if they have a nest egg, if they have enough savings, they may simply quit their jobs altogether or they move on to may move to another company where excellence is still uh, respected. Right. And I don't know, uh, you know, you know, you've, the reason I mentioned Boeing, of course, is Boeing has had a series of <laughs> a longstanding series of, defects and problems with planes crashing people dying and all of it all of it is caused by the diversity hires when they start outsourcing things to india for example and the indian it expert comes up with a certain solution for a to make a some kind of wing flap flap around but he uses code that is so amateuristic that the planes simply start dropping from the sky and people die you know that is because you let go of excellence in favor of diversity, in favor of cost cutting, right? You can't do that. You can't do it when, you know, imagine you, you being a white man, and you're 50 years old, you're extremely competent at a certain task for building planes, for example. Say you're an engineer, and all of a sudden your leader is this low IQ dumbass, a woman or someone, you know, a woman of color telling you, telling you to do things that make no sense whatsoever. Clearly, the whole organization is now disrupted. You're, you're not going to stay in that organization. Like I said, if you, have a, if you have savings, if you have the savings for it, you'll quit. Why would you stay in that job? You know? And so they call this the competency crisis. By favoring diversity over competency, the whole organization of the society is going to collapse. A society that was built by people with an average IQ of 100 is not going to be 
maintained by another people with an average IQ of 85. The systems will have to break down and collapse. Now, the diversifiers, they justify the process of affirmative action as follows. They say, oh, but we're not lowering the standards. We're just hiring, you know, black and brown people with the same standards. But they're not. First of all, they're not hiring white people who were even more competent than the passing, uh, you know, people of color. They are actually also lowering the standards to get more people of color in. So it's not true. You know, you can't say, oh, we still have competent surgeons. No, the best surgeons weren't hired because they were white. All right. Now you have surgeons who barely passed the medical exams. They're going to mess stuff up. And now you're lowering the standards since the white people know you can't. The white people no longer want to work for you. They're not even applying for jobs anymore. Now you, ha now you have a shortage of surgeons. So now you're going to lower the standards to get more people of color in them. Before you know it, hospitals become deathbeds rather than uh, places of uh, healing. Uh, I heard about this interesting statistic uh, at some point when, I think it was, this was in the USA, doctors nationwide went on a strike. And what happened is that the death rate dropped by 30%. Have you thought about how that's possible? It means that doctors are actually killing people. <laughs> Beware of going to a hospital. A lot of what doctors do to you is to sell treatment and to sell you medication. And you might actually be better off without it. So keep that in mind. When you grow old and you grow weak and feeble, think again if you need a doctor. <laughs> okay, let's see if I can answer more questions, you know. So do you believe in human evolution that we evolved from Homo erectus, shrews, etc.? Well, it's an interesting question. I don't, I don't know about, uh, I don't know, the, don't know that much about evolution. It's just that the Darwinian version of evolution theory may be completely wrong. Uh, Dar Darwin suggests that individual actors make the choices, the mating decisions, and therefore these individuals simply seek to establish their. Uh, their rational self-interest. But others like Hall Pike et al. have also informed me that no, individuals don't live alone. They live in a sphere called culture. And so any, any system of evolution that claims that it's individuals choosing mates and that is what drives evolution is completely false because those individuals live in a culture and it is really the culture, you know, if you... If you tip the sphere, if you uh, bring the sphere, if you change the sphere, people within that sphere will start will start behaving differently. So, any notion of evolution should always be talking about group evolution. There is always group evolution. That is why, you know, if you have the notion of a middle class, for example, if you look at the middle class wealth in the United States for the past fifty years, it has been dropping. It dropped by 60%, like the relative wealth, like your buying power dropped to the point where, of course, you no longer have a middle class. You can still call it a middle class. And it turns out that the U.S. billionaires, they reason that as long as America has a middle class, the people in it will want to support their system. Not realizing that the people in that middle class are now almost lower class and they don't support that system anymore. I mean, you can replace a high grossing, uh, say, white demographic with a, l a lower grossing uh, black demographic, but they're not going to keep supporting that system. That system is going to come down, right? You know, so, uh, yeah, there's a focus uh, towards making weapons of war. So let the idiots build the passenger planes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but it's a problem. You won't be able to fly anymore. Flying at some point will become so dangerous because, you know, you know, recently there was a door blown out of a Boeing plane because of loose bolts. You know, that's a quality check issue. That's an excellence issue. That's a competency issue. You know, a lot of this stuff will no longer work in the future. The Internet, for example, relies on such intricate, complicated networks. The, the Internet backbones around the world, for example, the, the glass fiber and so on. This stuff is going to come break, breaking down. Someone predicted that in the next five years, you may see cities in the United States simply go off electricity. You will simply will not have electricity for days on end, just as it is in certain parts of South Africa, for example. 
uh, it turns out you need a consistent, competent people in order to maintain civilization. Without it, things are going to degrade, fall apart. The elites will have trouble. The elites will have trouble. Even the elites will somehow will someday turn on the faucet and mud will come out, uh, come out of their faucets. They will start noticing and they will not be able to escape a power outage, right? Even they will suffer. And then they may start to think about, hmm, how, where did we go wrong? Where did you go wrong? You replaced competent white men because they were white with less competent and sometimes even unqualified people because they were diverse. That's where you went wrong. You literally swapped out the backbone of your society with jellyfish. You know, where can I talk? If you want to talk to me about conservatism, just send me a, you know, send me a DM, DM on TikTok or something. My DMs are open, so you can just write there, you know. I do have a Discord. Let me see if I can give you the link or something for it. I have a, I have a website called linkin.bio slash Johannes MK. And there you should also be able to find my Discord link. So I'll put it in the comment here if you can find it. Uh, my Discord here. I have a Discord thing. Here is my Discord invite. I hope it still works. Yeah, it should still work. So the Jays practiced banking, taxing, trading for centuries. Yeah, so I found out. Do you know how secret services were founded? What do you think? The secret services actually came from the postal services in Europe. And the early postal services in Europe came from Jewish merchants. The Jewish merchants had established their outposts and their trade routes and their networks in Europe. And then they began a postal service. But as one king from Prussia sends a letter to a king in Italy, the Jewish merchant who delivers that letter opens the letter. And so secret services started as a gigantic Jewish eavesdropping operation on the European elites. They were reading your messages. And now you understand that Facebook, WhatsApp are all extensions of the secret services that started as an eavesdropping operation by certain merchants in Europe. You bet that if you are a powerful rich person and you send messages through Facebook messages or Messenger or WhatsApp, you bet all of these messages were intercepted. This is how this merchant class became so well informed that they could bet for or against the Waterloo, for example, in the fight against Napoleon. This is how they were able to fund both sides because they knew if one king was going to go to war with another nation, they knew that they could invest in, in certain things or they could set up a stock market scheme. That's how they did it. That's how they became so wealthy, you know. Uh, for example, you know, Richard Nixon's took the dollar off of the gold standard. So the dollar and gold used to be tied. You had to have gold if you wanted to print more dollars. And they let, they let go of it. But you, do you know on whose orders Nixon did that? He did it on orders of three men living in London, uh, one of them being uh, Rothschild. So now you know. Is there music? Oh, wait, sorry. <laughs> Oh, I hadn't noticed the music because I didn't, I didn't hear it myself. So let me uh, turn it off. Okay. All right. So <laughs> sorry about the music. So I was, ex did you catch the whole story where I explained about how, uh, uh, where secret services came from? Did you miss that part? So let me, let me just tell you the story again. Secret services came from the European postal services, which were founded by Jewish merchants who had established their networks in Europe. And then these merchants uh, began reading King's letters, so to speak. They began reading, uh, you know, opening the letter so they knew exactly what was going to happen. So this is where they were simply, uh, you know, a super informed people. And that's how they got rich effectively, you know. <laughs> Sorry about the music. I, I, I didn't have the music uh, on myself, so I couldn't hear it. Uh, this DEI, yeah, I don't even know what that is. Yeah, yeah, it's prison. Yeah. All 
All right, all right. So, uh, I was just thinking of all sorts of things to talk about. Uh, what shall I mention to you now? <laughs> uh, well, like I said, I'm going to try to do these uh, live streams like for an hour and then once a week or so. That will be uh, the best for me. Let's see if today is uh, today's Tuesday. Okay, well, maybe I'll do it something like that. I um, I have like I have a plan for this year. I really want to find some kind of outfit or organization, or perhaps even some in some way found one myself so that we can start pushing for our interests in Europe. You see, I believe that you know, although the the United States economy I think may collapse. I don't know what will happen there. They're trying to save the economy by bringing in migrants. But the, like I said, the migrants coming in now, they have a considerably lower IQ than the, the founding stock of the USA. You're going to see a drop of like a full standard deviation. That's like 15 points from 100 to 85 on average, right? And you may not be able to compete with the Chinese people who on average are still, you know, uh, they're still smarter than that. They have a, at least a, like 98 99 or not 100 or so and so that's the problem with uh with us you 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 cannot compete with china if your population is considerably less intelligent intelligence just matters because intelligence is a foundation for competency and skill and for forethought and planning right and without it you will lose um the idea that merely having technology and resources is what will make you wealthy is totally false you need you need technology you need resources and you need to mix that with human intelligence skill and competency and without that human dimension the other two things have no value at all you know a orangutan may be able to use a saw but will not be able to build a house with it right uh, and chimpanzee probably won't even be able to use a saw uh, gorillas were probably never even touched the saw we are right so intelligence matters you know you know basically if i would say it this way uh, a society built by orangutans cannot be taken over by chimpanzees let's just say it like that you know oh sorry uh what do you think of generation identity yeah i looked into that years ago generation identitaire it used to be i think it started as a french thing I don't know what this is all about. I am suspicious of any such pan-European movement that come that pops up out of the blue. Is it perhaps possible that they are trying to do to us the same thing that Zelensky did to the Ukrainian neo-Nazis? In Ukraine, they began heavily promoting neo-Nazism uh, and, and justifying it and legitimizing it, right? Uh, as a way to get men, to trick men into fighting the Russians, as though the Russians, they presented the Russians as a sort of mixed hybrid Asiatic type of people, and they were not pure white people, and therefore the Ukrainian pure white men, they had to fight the Russians. They really tricked those Ukrainian neo-Nazis into killing themselves. And isn't that what they're doing with, like, with Meloni with the Fratelli d'Italia, you know, the, the Italian brothers? That's a massive fascist movement. Are they doing a generational identity, a generation identity? Isn't that what they're doing with all these things? They're trying to inculcate into the minds of European men that we need to fight the impure Russians while at the same time our cities are being flooded with, you know, Muslims and Arabs and, and Africans, right? Oh, that's okay. It's okay to just leave Paris and London and just turn our backs to our civilization and then fight the Russians. This is just so wrong. This is what the Americans want. This is all American planning. It's not our planning. So maybe our European elites have lost their minds. Huh? Maybe our European elites are not as clever as we, as they used to be in the past, you know. So to clarify, I do not support, uh, you know, tricking men into killing themselves into yet another foreign war. Our war is here in Europe, in our own, on our own lands, our own farms and bridges need to be defended. You know, our war is against our capitals almost. Our capitals are full of... Uh, traitors you know our capitals are f that's where the enemy really lives and they they wield the economic power from the cities and the media power is wielded from the cities if you want to either topple these things or take over whichever suits you whichever you can do but you don't want to turn your back to your own country at this point 
you know, there's a reason why the UK and the USA have a massive recruiting issue. They don't seem to be able to, be able to get the young men uh, to want to become soldiers, to go to war. I, I suppose that the, the native white men, they don't want to wa waste these wars anymore. They realize that this is not in their benefit. And the immigrant men, lots of immigrant men, Pakistani, Indian, African, they actually support Putin. <laughs> so <clears throat> how are you going to recruit brown men if they actually support Putin? They're not going to fight for you. They will become mercenary armies that maybe the Russians will be able to turn against the U.S. So you're shooting yourself in the foot. And meanwhile, the middle class white man, they don't want to join the army anymore. Are you crazy? <clears throat> yeah, someone says uh, they have a problem in Sweden with 20 percent immigrants. Yeah, but those immigrants, they are probably more likely to support Putin. So you have a, a cohort of, of enemies in your own country anyway. So what are you doing? <laughs> you know, they're saying that Sweden needs to prepare for war against Russia for reasons because uh, Sweden and Finland are somehow a strategic territory, right? But, you know, this is going this is going to go so bad and so wrong. What are we fighting for? We're fighting for LGBT and diversity and we have we have to do the dying. No, this is not going to work out, is it? Yeah, China isn't collapsing. I, ha I, I didn't. Did I say that? No, I don't believe China is collapsing. China is very firmly secured and I think China is going to be able to take Taiwan away from the West, which means that China will become the uh, owner of the global electronics and, and so on. Uh, it means that it, at some point, the United States won't even be able to supply itself with uh, electronics for its own weapons. <clears throat> Here. The USA is a debtor nation, yeah. Why do immigrants support Putin? Well, you know, the black immigrants, the Africans, they hate the West so much, they simply love Putin for just for that reason. All right? They love Putin and Xi. Uh, same, with, same with many other immigrants. They are uh, the victims of colonialism. <laughs> Have you heard about that? So they don't support the West. They support the enemies of the West, meaning they support Putin and Xi. China has global manufacturing. It's going to be a century of transition as the U.S. loses hegemony. Not a century, just a decade. It will be done within 10 years. I read uh, somewhere that United States think tanks expect Germany to be fully recovered from its defeat at uh, the end of the Second World War uh, by no later than the year 2050. And they say that turmoil within the USA may even expedite this so that Germany could be totally independent from U.S. influence within, say, 10 years, 20 years, no more than that. What that and that's the reason why they bombed Nord Stream. That's the reason why Germany had to shut down its nuclear power plants, because they don't want Germany to have an industry that can link up with Russian resources and with the Chinese market. Basically, the Eurasian idea is that uh, Europe, Russia and China together would become extremely wealthy and profitable and powerful. Um, the problem with this is that uh, the United States is trying to prevent that from happening, and they are willing to destroy Western Europe merely to have uh, to retain power. So that's a big deal. Yeah, of course, Putin is doing whatever he can to get allies on his side. And you know what they're doing in the Western world? Why do you think that England, Wales, Scotland, um, Ireland, why do they all, uh, London, of course, right, why do they all have these foreign Indian Pakistani PMs and leaders? It's not because they're more competent. It's because the West needs to get India on its side in the war against China. Basically, what they would like to do is to get Indian men to go to war with China. And in order to get the Indians to go to war with China, we have to trick the Indians, like delude them into thinking that they are part of the West now. And that's why you see the, uh, Vivek in the United States and Nikki Haley. She's also of Indian descent. Nikki Haley, Vivek, those types are uh, running because they want they need India and Pakistan on the side of the West against China. And but I don't know if this is going to work out. The, the leadership in India itself is not so easily fooled. They're not stupid, right? But perhaps people coming to the West are somewhat stupid. <clears throat> yeah, running for U.S. Republican. Yeah, no, Nikki Haley and Vivek are both running for the Republicans. Yeah, I know it's it's weird. 
Yeah, <laughs> Nikki Haley. What's her real name? Nimarata. <laughs> Germany is owned by the Zionists. Yes, by U.S. Zionists. Right. Uh, they've been cracked down and uh, you know oppressed since 1945. So. But like I said, American think tanks actually expect Germany to be able to be independent uh, by the year 2050 latest. So probably earlier. Uh, that's just 25 years from now. Everything would change. The United States would simply be dead at that point because the United States uh, cannot confront a Eurasian power. If Europe, Russia and China would be more, inter more interconnected through the new Silk Road networks, the United States is going to be like the myth of Atlantis, as though it never existed. That's why I think I already mentioned uh, in the newsletter I sent out that uh, white Americans should be welcomed back home in Europe if we prefer you over any other migrant, obviously. That's a strange thing for you to say that you think Chinese people hardly drive a motor vehicle. How are they going to fight a modern war? So you're not aware that they actually are able to build carrier ships that are more modern, more advanced than those that the U.S. has. They're a massive threat. China excels in like 40 out of 50 top industries in, in terms of uh, high tech manufacturing. Europe and the U.S. are becoming a technological third world backwater due to the competency crisis. Because guess what? We in the West, we are promoting uh, incompetent people based on the color of their skin into positions of power and leadership. Guess what will happen when you do that? you die you know do you think the netherlands should be part of brie you mean bricks or something uh i think europe needs to become a standalone republic i have a vision of europe becoming a republic where we promote uh our people's virtues we want people to be virtuous meaning that we will be morally and ethically a superior people in the way that we behave and in the way our, that our culture operates but at the same time we will realize we will be aware of the fact that other people won't be like that so we will treat each other equally in europe but we will not do that to others unless you know based on the tit for tat principle they show us goodwill we will show them goodwill <clears throat> tit for tat is a very powerful principle by the way i was thinking about it today Tit for tat does not mean you're going to give people anything for nothing in return. No, you're going to do business with those people who are beneficial to you. So if someone is a benefit to you, you make sure that you are a benefit to them. But if somebody uh, is a cost to you, then you make sure you are a cost to them. If somebody tries to inflict a cost on you, you make sure that it costs them to try to do so. That's tit for tat. So tit for tat works both ways. And that is why it's such a, a, a powerful principle in dealing with people and organizations or whatever. If, you, if someone is beneficial to you, you can be beneficial. You should be beneficial to them so that you can keep being beneficial to each other. But if somebody is negative, if somebody insults you, I suppose responding with an insult isn't very effective. But if people insult you, you can block them out of your life. They are no longer part of your life. Or if people attack you, you immediately you know, fight back. You defend yourself. Or if somebody threatens you, then you make yourself big and tall and you look angrily at them, right? And you make sure that you are also a threat to them. You always respond like that in tit for tat. Uh, I think you could actually base your whole moral system on tit for tat, just on tit for tat, you know? Uh, now, the Christians say, Christ said something like, oh, you got to treat people the way you want them to treat you, but not quite there's a bit of a problem there is that if i want somebody to be nice to me and i'm always nice to them while they are threatening and attacking me then i'll just get hurt and that's not the right not what you should do in tit for tat you would not do that in tit for tat you make a contribution to show somebody that you want to be in a beneficial mutually beneficial relation with them but if they attack you boom it's over then you immediately switch to giving them back what they give you if they give you harm you give them harm back they give you threats, you give them threats. And that's the real tit for tat. That's the real turning the other cheek, the way I would say. It would be wrong for you if somebody beats you then to turn your other cheek and to be beaten again. But rather, 
you can reinterpret the whole notion of turning the other cheek in this sense. If somebody, somebody out of the blue would beat you, right, then you raise your fist and you turn the other cheek to knock them out. That's, that's a different interpretation of turn the other cheek that I think is better. And I don't think there's a problem in that, that if you, even if you are a very, very religious Christian, you can still reinterpret these biblical messages to make sure that we're not going to be on the losing side anymore. We will never be on the losing side anymore. Europe can be a Christian Sparta, an independent republic with all its nations intact. The nations would be members of the republic, right? We have the European Union now anyway. Why don't we repurpose it? Instead of this Soviet-style communist socialist nonsense, we turn that, we turn the EU into a European republic. Right? or simply the Republic. We don't even have to call it the European Republic. Just call it the Republic. You know? <clears throat> uh, but then we make this Republic, uh, we make it a center of virtue. We, we expect people to live virtuous lives. We expect the state to support the people into becoming these best versions of themselves. We will show that on every level, in politics and in business and in culture, excellence is valued so we're not going to be like boeing we're going to be the opposite of boeing we're going to be people we will promote people of excellence to positions of power and authority right and we're not going to well what if you're not the best well then you'll have a lower rank and what if you're truly evil well then you're out you can live somewhere else you know we're not going to be so anal about this anymore um Tit for tat does not mean you must treat everybody equally because you want them to treat you equally. No, tit for tat means if you notice that in your dealings with people, they don't treat you equally, then you don't treat them equally. Tit for tat. You give them back what they give you. And this comes down to a, a certain moral principle. It turns out that Europeans naturally always had what is called a, um, a unitarian morality. That means you have one morality. That is the same morality for your family as for everybody else in your society. Whereas people from India, people from Turkey, people from North Africa and so on, they have what is called a dual morality. That means they have one morality for their immediate family members and another morality for people outside of their family. Uh, in India, there's a saying that goes like this. The tears of strangers are just water. The tears of strangers are just water. Get it? So they, they don't care about the tears of strangers because that's just water. But the tears of your family, those are real tears, and then you give them a hug, right? And it turns out Indian people, Chinese people too, Turkish people, African people, they are all like that. There was only one race of people in human history who ever had this unitarian morality where we treat our own family members the way we treat everyone else non-family members and that according to max weber a german uh, thinker uh, was the reason why capitalism started in the west in germany in england and so on we started modern civilization because we could rely on our fellow citizens even if we were not directly related even if they were not family but you can't do that. Even today, you can't do that in Turkey. You can't start an industrial revolution in Africa because the Africans have a dual morality. They care more for their own family and not at all for people who are not related to them. You see this even in court cases in the United States where an African-American man has raped and killed a girl. And then he says to his lawyer that he expects to be acquitted. And the lawyer is surprised, like, why do you think you'll be acquitted? Said, well, because the evidence is in, right? And then, and then the, the killer says, well, the jury members are not related to the girl, so why would they care about her? That's the dual morality system. This still exists in many African Americans today. Despite having lived with and among white people for four centuries now, many African Americans still have the dual morality system meaning they treat their own family members correctly, but they treat everybody else as dust, as, oh, their tears are just water. They, they aren't real people. They don't matter. What do the jury members care about this girl that I killed and raped, right? Because they're not related to her, so why would they care? They're going to acquit me. 
this is amazing that you can actually believe that, that you'll be acquitted if the evidence is in, because you think the jury members don't care about the girl. But of course, in a unitarian morality system, most of the jur jury members in such a case would care about this girl, even if they weren't related to her. And that is the European supremacy, the European moral supremacy. And I think it is such a valuable thing for us to have. We cannot allow this to go away. And that may mean that eventually we must either sever ourselves from the dual morality diversity, right? Or keep the migrants out, keep the diversity out. Either way, we can leave or they leave. We leave or they leave. Either way, we need to preserve our morality so that we can treat ourselves, you know, our own race of people and our family members somewhat the same way, right? And that those other people, the majority of the world, who have this dual morality system, let them suffer in poverty. It's really their own problem. If they can't upgrade their morality to start treating non-family members somewhat more equally as they treat their family members, that is their problem. If that's the reason why they're poor, if that's the reason why they can't have an industrial civilization, if that's the reason why they can't progress and advance themselves, it's all their problem, tit for tat. We don't have to babysit people who are never going to respect us in the first place, you know? Yeah, I see some people enjoying what I'm what I'm talking about. Yeah, let me see if I can answer some stuff over here, you know. Yeah. Enough of this toxic neolib pseudo green agenda and its freedom and democracy humorous. Yeah, exactly. Enough of it, you know. <clears throat> Thoughts on Christians that support mustache man that is and its ideology. Isn't that contradicting? Uh, yeah, is it? Is it contradicting, you know? What I really understand of that period is that Mustache Man was, in fact, trying to defend Christianity in Europe against the atheist communist, against the atheist socialist, also the French socialist. They were also atheists. So Germany was almost a beacon of Christianity. Germany and Italy were beacons of Christianity trying to defend this stuff. You know, <clears throat> they didn't work, you know. I never really thought of that until you illustrated it in a live stream concerning the IQ and <laughs> hunter. Okay. Yeah. And hunter gatherers. Yeah. I suppose so. Yeah. Oh yeah. I remember. Yeah. Hunter gatherers. Yeah. They, uh, they don't need abstract thinking. They can, you can win as a hunter gatherer without being smart. Uh, but in order to win in an advanced civilization, you need to be smart. <clears throat> so why did, Civilization arise in the Levant. I don't think it arose there. It did not arise in the Levant. Civilization arose in what we call Mesopotamia, ancient Mesopotamia, which is Iraq. But of course, uh, the people who, who were living there, say, 8,000 years ago, they had blonde hair and blue eyes. They probably had the Unitarian morality anyway. <clears throat> I prefer Norse mythology to Christianity. Yeah. I think it's very valuable. You know, I'm also torn, torn about this. We have these two worlds. You have the Norse mythology, which I care about a lot, but then you also have Catholicism and Christianity. I was baptized in Roman Catholic. Basically, the way I see it, Christianity is the religion and the Norse stuff is the mythology, and you can draw from both, you know. No, it's not. The Levant is not Mesopotamia. The Levant is Israel. Palestine, that's the Levant, you know. All right, I think I'm going to call the quits for today. I've been speaking for about an hour, and that's basically when I know that my time is up. You can go to my website. Uh, let's see if this is, does this still work? I have some, uh, I have a YouTube channel. No, it doesn't work. Okay, so you can go to my YouTube channel at The Great Johannes. Well, I will, I will repost this video there. You can go to my substack, www.jmk.info. Like so. And what else? I have a Twitter at JohannesMKX. Um, well, other stuff. Oh, and my Telegram backup for my TikTok videos. My Telegram is at Johannes MK. So I'll see you. Uh, I'll see you next week. I'll do it once a week from now on. <clears throat>